Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 9th of April. I'm Robert Barwick. I'm joined today by a Citizens Party founder and leader, Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. In this week's Citizens Report, bombshell. Christine Holgate reveals the truth and calls for infrastructure bank getting louder. So first, Craig, bombshell. Christine Holgate reveals the truth. Before we get into the details of that, I just want to mention two things. We have a petition on change.org in circulation. Please sign and share it. And if you've already signed and shared it, share it again and again and again. There's a hearing coming up in Parliament next Tuesday. Today's Friday the 9th. On Tuesday, there's a hearing in Parliament. I'll be there. We'd like to get that petition to 10,000 signatures before that hearing. That's the petition calling for Scott Morrison to apologise to Christine Holgate and reinstate her. Second, I want to announce a campaign that is not our initiative. It's Christine Holgate's supporters among the staff and licensed post offices of Australia. Post have come up with an initiative, a campaign called Wear White to Unite Against Workplace, workplace Bullying, which is actually what she suffered, except she suffered it at the hands of the Prime Minister on down. Um, and that's why she's, she was forced out of Australia Post. This is, this is actually a, a very admirable campaign. Campaign. They're asking people on that day, on the 9th of April, um, sorry, on the, uh, the 13th of April, on the day of the hearing, wear white to express support for Christine Holgate. And in fact, Craig, at 10 o'clock on the 13th of April, all post offices around Australia, licensed post offices, are going to stop using their tills for a minute to commemorate what's actually going on, right? Because this, uh, this campaign is actually heating up. So let's get into the details of that because this week what happened was this, uh, the 150 page submission that Christine Holgate prepared for the Australia Post inquiry was made public and it has set off a flurry of publicity, so much so that regular viewers of our show will know we like to sort of give you the publicity on these campaigns that we go on so you're aware of it. It's too much. It was wall-to-wall -wall publicity. Um, I'm going to, though, play one clip, and it's quite a lengthy one, but it's, it was the best of all the publicity. It was on the 7.30 report the other night. Um, this was Laura Tingle, and what's good about this clip is she tells the whole story. And this is a story that, Craig, this show uniquely told, and no one else was telling when the Watchers thing first blew up. Robbie, I also think it's to our viewers' credit as well that, that a number, of, a large number of people have been calling their MPs exactly, and actually getting mobilised. And this is what the Citizens Party are about. It, one of our mottos, our new model, is our citizens taking responsibility. Well, if you take responsibility for your nation, if you talk to your members of parliament, email them and so forth, you can create changes like we've seen with this campaign with Christine Holgate. So we got the word out because we knew there was something else that was much bigger than the watches. We got the word out that this was about the banking deal that she had done, etc. And so finally... 7.30 report did its job. Laura Tingle did this report two nights ago. There were a small number of senior people who'd put in an inordinate amount of work in and they did receive an award from the chair, myself, and on behalf of the board. They were a Cartier watch of about a value of $3,000 each. Four Cartier watches presented as an example of fat cat largesse and what is known in politics as bad optics. Six months on, the outrage they provoked from the Prime Minister on the day seemed curiously out of whack with the scandals that have engulfed his government since. I was appalled. It's disgraceful. And it's not on. The Chief Executive wishes to stand aside. Well, not wishes to stand aside. She's been instructed to stand aside. And if she doesn't wish to do that, Mr Speaker, she can go. Yes, the Prime Ministerial outrage was so high it was on the needles in the strawberry scale. But there were just two problems with all the outrage. The first was the backstory about the Cartier watches. The second was that the reputation of one of Australia's most successful businesswomen, Christine Holgate, was destroyed in a few minutes of outrage that has subsequently come to look badly misplaced. Angela Cramp runs two post offices in Wollongong. She is also one of thousands of local post office, or LPO, operators who are outraged at Christine Holgate's treatment. 
She convinced three major banks and up to 70 minor banks, second tier lenders, to actually invest in the LPO network and contribute $220 million worth of revenue over a five year period. It changed our payments, it paid our staff. It was groundbreaking. The four Australia Post executives who scored the Cartier watches had locked in a deal which saved around 3,000 community post offices across Australia. It is just atrocious. I want her reinstated. Holgate ultimately left Australia Post in hotly contested circumstances and has kept her counsel until now. But in an explosive 154-page submission to a Senate inquiry, the businesswoman has bluntly stated that Australia Post's chairman, Lucio de Bartolomeo, has lied to the Senate and that she was thrown under the bus by both Australia Post and the Morrison government. To be clear, the purchase of the four watches as a reward for the efforts of executives who delivered the pivotal bank at post deal was legal, within Australia Post policies, within my own signing authority limits, approved by the previous chairman, expensed appropriately and signed off by auditors and the CFO. It was then found to be legal by the review, which was clearly intended to find it otherwise. Yet somehow, I was forced out of my job over it. But also to reflect Holgate says she was stood down unlawfully on October 22, but that after, quote, the 10 most difficult and disappointing days of her career, the former Blackmore's chief executive offered to resign, but did not actually do so. Without responding to Holgate, Australia Post announced within hours that she had resigned. Her salary and emails were cut off. The matter is still unresolved. She says Mr Di Bartolomeo told the Senate she had agreed to stand down without evidence to substantiate this and despite considerable evidence that she did not agree to stand down. Holgate documents at length how she was abandoned by the two ministers responsible for Australia Post, Communications Minister Paul Fletcher and Finance Minister Simon Birmingham. But it is worth remembering who first claimed public credit for sacking her. Chief Executive wishes to stand aside. Well, not wishes to stand aside. She's been instructed to stand aside. And if she doesn't wish to do that, Mr Speaker, she can go. By today, though, it seemed the Prime Minister was, as is so often the case, not the man responsible. This is a matter now that's substantively between Ms Holgate and, and Australia Post, and that's where I note that the predominance of her comments have been directed. Um, Ms Holgate decided to um, leave Australia Post. That's just a matter of record. It's quite clear to anybody watching on that there are two sets of rules. One for the boys club and one for women in politics. And sadly, um, what we see is that Ms Holgate was victim of that. So there you go, Craig. That tells the whole story and that it also featured um, Angela Cramp, who I reckon is the best spokesman, any spokesperson, any trade association in Australia has ever had. She's so, she's such a powerhouse and she gets to the nub of the issue and it obviously persuaded Laura Tingle. And the other thing about that particular clip, Craig, is that Laura Tingle gave due credence to the fact that Christine Holgate hasn't resigned. Yeah. And that's the nub of the issue about whether she'll be able to come back or not. It's a bit of a right? shock, Robbie, to get straight coverage. I mean, this was yeah. <laughs> it, it's in this day and age, everything's yep. got a spin on it, but this one didn't. No, it's very good. All right, we're going to take a break and come back and deal more on this subject afterwards. Welcome back to the Citizens Report, where we're discussing bombshell. Christine Holgate reveals the truth. So. The nub of what Christine Holgate revealed in her submission is that the chairman of Australia Post lied. And she identified the two main issues he lied about. He lied about her standing down and he lied or, or, or he claimed she agreed to stand down and she didn't. And he lied about this Boston Consulting Group report, which we've devoted episodes of this show to the fact that this is a report the government's keeping secret from Parliament because it exposes the privatisation agenda behind the moves to get rid of her. 
right? I mean, the, you know, people have, and the privatization craze can happen in one or two ways. Actually, you know, bundle up the organization, sell it off. There's another form of privatization though, where they so weaken the organization that it allows all these big multinationals to sweep swoop in. Companies like DHL, which has the contract to, to um, distribute the vaccines around Australia, for instance, right? Big multinationals to swoop in and take over Australia Post business because mm. it's not in any position to, to um, uh, compete anymore. And, and you might say, what's wrong with that? Well, once that happens, if, a, if, a, if the organisation is so weakened, it will not be able to sustain its network of post offices around Australia and you will see the, the, the ultimate collapse of the organisation. Well, essentially, right? Robert, you're talking about the elimination of a public service. Yes. And the idea since the 70s, since we've been, done a lot of work on an organisation called the Mont Pelerin Society, is that government is ineffective, government's inefficient, therefore you've got to outsource everything to the private sector. What they're not telling you is, though, because they want to make a buck, so the services that people should be getting from their taxes and from their government are basically being offloaded onto private uh, organisations where you've got to pay for them again. No, exactly. And that's where the that's where this uh, this this push has come. And the Liberal government's championed this for the last fifty years. Well, but as as we know, the public, all this time later, hates it. Of course. Right? And that's why they're keeping this report secret. And that's why the chairman lied about it. And Christine Holgate has shown just how many times he lied. Um, and, and the fact that she actually proves in her submission the lies. And the only conclusion you can draw is he lied on behalf of the government in both instances. He lied to get rid of her and he lied about this Boston Consulting Group report. And so consequently, um, as a result of this submission, the, Morrison and the people around him are ducking for cover, mm. Craig. I'm going to play a clip on Morrison um, that is just extraordinary because he... When he was asked about this in a press conference, this submission, in a press conference the next day, this week, um, instead of being the fire-breathing dragon he'd been in Parliament the day he monstered her, right? It's like, it was like, oh, you know, oh, nothing to do with me. This is between her and Australia Post. And so what somebody did very cleverly is, is create a clip contrasting Morrison on the day, the 22nd of October, when he, when he uh, unloaded on her in Parliament, to how he was a few days ago in this press conference. And you can see that he cannot, and the reason, the fact that the clip was done means he's not gonna get away with this tack where he's trying to duck for cover and, and stay out of, the, out of the, the firing line. Watch this. She's been instructed to stand aside. And if she doesn't wish to do that, Mr. Speaker, she can go. Ms. Holgate decided to um, leave Australia Post. That's just a matter of record. She's been instructed to stand aside, and if she doesn't wish to do that, Mr Speaker, she can go. She was literally sacked on the floor of Parliament. There was a, uh, a review that was undertaken into the matters that were brought up by the Senate in, uh, at estimates, um, and before that was concluded, Ms Holgate decided to leave Australia Post. Now, that, that's, that's just a matter of record, and these issues now, as I understand it, are between Ms Holgate and Australia Post, and I'll leave that matter there for the, for, for the time being. Now, I will say, in that clip, you saw Catherine King of the Labor Party, and she, what she said was right, that she was, Christine Holgate was effectively sacked on the floor of Parliament. I am a bit sick, though, Craig, of all these Labor women who are jumping on the bandwagon now who are trying to make it, and, and there is an element of this that, which is about the treatment of women, I don't deny that, that that's, that's a serious issue. But they're trying to make it entirely about that and act all sincere on Christine Holgate's behalf, when at the time there was a Labor woman, Kimberly Kitching, who initiated this attack with an ambush that she had to go hire an archeologist to go back that far and dig up the evidence right, and probably do, probably do um, carbon-14 dating, Craig, <laughs> on the watches. <laughs> Right, because it was so long ago to find these things to attack her with, to attack Christine Holgate with in Parliament, and everyone saw how she was treated, and none of these women women said a word at the time. Mm. Right, they're jumping on the bandwagon. So I'm disgusted at that. I have to therefore acknowledge Bob Catter because of all there's a 250 people in that Parliament. One member of Parliament did not care about the sort of the political look of defending a fat cat CEO with watches. He knew it was wrong and he spoke up straight away, right? And I know that actually meant a lot to the licensed post officers. You know, now the truth is out. Everyone's jumping on the bandwagon. You've got to take your hat off to, to Bob Catter. But also Morrison's attack on her in Parliament was to intimidate everyone else. I mean, because how can they speak up and then exactly. you know, you're, you're reprimanding or countermanding the Prime Minister? Yep. I mean, that's why people got to keep their mouth shut in the Liberal Party. Well, that, that, no, exactly. But 
there's also, there's also an element where th it's times like this which people prove their metal, all right? And the people that do prove their metal, they're the ones you, you watch for in, in, the, in the political process. Um, the other person I have to single out is Josh Frydenberg, who this week he said something disgusting. He called Christine Holgate's treatment appropriate. And for him to say that, in the, now that everybody knows what they know, is just disgusting, especially for this reason, Craig. Josh Frydenberg, of everybody in that building, knows better than anybody else how important the banking deal was that Christine Holgate awarded the watches for because he helped her do the deal two years later. She thanked him publicly for it at the time, yet he said nothing when she was attacked over those watches to provide any context that it was for that deal. He stayed silent and let her be attacked, and now this week he calls what she suffered appropriate. Right? These people are pathetic Cowards. He was in new into the job when this happened too, Robbie, with the uh, the banking deal, yep. the bank at post with the uh, Christina had initiated, and I suspect he got clobbered. Yeah, well, and that's no, and that's politics as usual, right? But yeah. here's the thing: um, we expect these people to be leaders, right? And I'm, I'm reminded of the of one politician who attacked Josh Frydenberg and said he's a liberal, not a leader. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but let me let me say this. There's a contrast to this. The outpouring of support for Christine Holgate in the wake of this submission has been enormous. Um, and including, most importantly, not just people saying she was wrong, but actually saying she must be reinstated. And that includes, Craig, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, former Prime Minister, put out a tweet the other night saying she should be reinstated. He has a million followers that went to. Another former Liberal leader, John Hewson, said the same thing, that she should be reinstated. Hundreds of people around Australia of, of sort of, you know, standing, business leaders, etc., political leaders have said the same thing. So this is what it's going to come down to. As I mentioned earlier, D-Day is next week, 13th of April. I'll be up there for the, for the public hearing. Um, the committee has put up a... Um, and remember, we brought about this hearing with our campaign, right? This, 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 uh, this inquiry with our campaign. The committee has put up a letter on its website to Australia Post and made it public, firing a warning shot across their bow, warning them that they are not to interfere with potential witnesses who want to participate in the committee because the committee says, Sarah Hanson-Young, who's the chair, said she, the committee understands that's what Australia Post is doing. So they have taken the gloves off on Australia Post. I've never right? seen that, Robbie. No, before. I've never seen it either. We've been involved in quite a few uh, committees now. So this just speaks to the huge turmoil behind the scenes. Quickly though, Craig, question for you. Whatever happens in this whole saga, and it's been a saga, it at least has exposed the powerful vested interest in the way Australia is run. And that spotlight will ultimately help clean it up so we can achieve the good policy outcomes we want, like a public bank, like a postal bank, right? Yeah, as you said before, Robbie, people hate the privatisation agenda. That's what's behind this, this whole attack on Christine Holgate to get rid of her because she was successful in overturning a program to destroy Australia Post and, and uh, bring it down, make it unprofitable so it could be sold off. The Boston Consulting Group, uh, you know, um, report, that's now going to be in the spotlight as well. Yep. So the true yep. agenda is coming out, and this is good because this is going to help to overturn 40 to 50 years of policies that have destroyed this country and policies that we've been fighting against, you know, for the 33 years, Robbie. So this is good news. It's a good direction. No, exactly. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about how calls for an infrastructure bank are getting louder. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. Finally, calls for infrastructure bank getting louder. So, Craig, the big development this week um, came from the United States, where the president, the new president, Joe Biden, announced a $2 trillion infrastructure investment. Now, it's great in principle, and it's sorely needed, right? We, we, we've said, if we've said it once, we've said it a thousand times on this show, if America got its own house in order and started to focus on the infrastructure it needs, it'll be too busy doing that to start wars around the world, mm. right? So this, this is very good. So it's desperately needed, but the devil is in the detail, and unfortunately, we won't go through all of it, but there's a, you know, a lot of it is hot air, right? And there's an obsession with, with green infrastructure, which frankly... Um, once, it, what's funny about that is you get a lot of these American politicians saying, "See, we're going to we're now going to compete with China." Well, not if you not if you're doing everything solar powered. You're not. That said, there is positive stuff. Things like a, 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 a renewed focus on nuclear power, right? And some good stuff may come out of that. However, 
I want to give an se- example of why a lot of it's small potatoes. And there's a quote in the, the, the White House announcement on this that says this, the plan will invest about 1% of GDP per year over eight years to upgrade our nation's infrastructure, revitalize manufacturing, invest in basic research and science, shore up supply chains and solidify our care infrastructure. Now, end quote. Now, um, eight, 1% investment, given it how far behind America is on infrastructure, they, get a, they, get a C, they got upgraded to a C minus in their last report card from a D, mm. right? They're way behind on infrastructure. 1% per year is pathetically small. The late, great Lance Endersby, the, the uh, engineering professor that the Citizens Party had a lot to do with and, and helped us develop a lot of our infrastructure policies for Australia, he used to like to highlight that in the 1970s, Craig, Australia was spending 8% of GDP on infrastructure. 8%. And I can assure you, China spends a lot more than 1% of GDP on infrastructure, right? We, we now are about 4% or less, um, but it's still higher than 1%, right? So why 1%? Well, because it all comes down to money. And you'll see that this is a debate about money. And that's why the real question is, where's the infrastructure bank? Right. We, got, we know this, Pete, there's, a, there's, a coal, there's an organisation in America called the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. They're fighting very hard for America to, to adopt an infrastructure bank to fund this so that the government, instead of being the lender, the, the borrower, the government becomes the lender. Right? And this is how we've done shows on how Franklin Roosevelt did this with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation after, in, in um, the Great Depression. I think, right, Robbie, the thing here for people is it's not, we're not talking about money per se. We're talking about direction of credit into exactly. the economy. We're talking about funding the future. And if people just have a think about the Sydney Harbour Bridge, for example, if that didn't exist. Now, yeah. there was, at, when that was built, there was huge cries, oh, it's going to cost too much money. But imagine you didn't have it. Yeah. Look at the breakdown in commerce and travel. That inf- that's what infrastructure does. It acts like a catalyst for the economy. You build good infrastructure. Yes, it costs money in the form of credit. But that credit comes back to you multiple times. And that's what, uh, that's, in today's monetarist economy, it is how do we make the quickest buck for the private yep. institutions yep. as fast as we can. No, exactly. So, so the question is, will America do this properly, right, and actually make infrastructure work for it, or are they going to do it in something in a Band-Aid way? So put that aside, though, that is, that is helping people think about it. What I've noticed, what, what I want to go through is the calls for an infrastructure bank are, that we've been pushing like crazy here actually getting louder here. And I want to give you some examples. So the other week we did a show where we, we highlighted how the LNP Member of Parliament, um, George Christensen for Queensland, he's just chaired a committee that's recommended a national development bank for Australia, which is sort of similar to a national infrastructure bank. Um, so that's now a government committee recommending it. The Nationals, Craig, the National Party have finally got their act together. They've produced a 20-page policy paper. It's called Australian Manufacturing 2035, which sets out a plan to double manufacturing employment, that is to add another 800,000 jobs in manufacturing over the next 15 years. And that includes this, quote, establish a concessional lending facility for investments in our manufacturing capacity by expanding the remit of the Regional Investment Corporation to include new low-cost long-term finance for strategic manufacturing industries, effectively a development bank. And I have to acknowledge, I take, I've taken that quote from the National Civic Council's News Weekly publication because they've been reporting this. That is, a, that is an excellent development. It just shows you in Parliament the focus is, has been on this. That means the National Party have joined the ranks of other parties like uh, One Nation, Bob Catter, the Greens, etc., we're going to continue this um, for YouTube viewers. Goodbye to Channel 31 viewers. Okay, so Craig, um, but the other example I want to give, just in a little bit of extra time we're going to take here, is that one of the biggest promoters of an infrastructure bank in the parliament is Senator Jared Rennie. And he's an LNP senator, a Liberal senator from, from Queensland. I just want to get, this, this is just to give people a flavour of how much this is becoming topical in politics today, right? Um, so just before I do, just to recap that list of people, you've got in the parliament, you have, these are the, these are the parties and, and individuals pushing an infrastructure bank or a development bank, public bank. Uh, the Greens, One Nation, Qatar, now the Nationals with their manufacturing policy, and then individuals inside both the major parties, right? And one of the ones we're going to highlight now is, is uh, Jared Rennick. So he's just put up this Facebook post 
Um, and I'm going to read out the post, and you'll see the clip he plays with the post, um, which, which is, you know, the message he wants to get across is develop Australia to own Australia, right? This is what he says, quote, As a sovereign nation, Australia should build, own and operate its own infrastructure. Over the last 40 years, Australian governments have sold off infrastructure that provided essential services such as electricity, insurance, banking and freight. This has made it harder to fund other essential services such as schools and hospitals. It's time Australia, with funding from the RBA, started its own infrastructure bank to build infrastructure to underpin our sovereignty and prosperity. By building more infrastructure, governments can provide better services and lower taxes. So, I mean, you know, I just think that's an excellent um, exp you know, expression of the policy from Senator Rennick, and there's a, there's a groundswell here. So, Craig, you started the Citizens' Party, then the CEC, 33 years ago, when all these types of institutions were actually being shut down. Mm. Would you say the tide is turning? Oh, Robbie, look, I think you can say that the psyche of the Australian population has within it the idea of what the Commonwealth Bank used to represent. Yep. Go back and have a look at the history, and a lot of people know the history of the Commonwealth Bank because it functioned like a national bank, a development bank. It funded our wars, World War I and World War II, uh, indirectly by um, you know, controlling the private banks in many respects. But it if funded you go, our economic development that allowed us to wage those wars. Yeah, and look, yeah. the point is that you need a development bank to fund basic economic infrastructure, real infrastructure. And we were back in uh, 1990, we produced Sovereign Australia, an economic development program to save our nation. In 1990, that's 31 years go. ago. And the point is, in that document, we go through the absolute need to look at the physical economy of the nation. Now, we've been through COVID, we're going through COVID-19, right? Any wise politicians, anyone that's got the interest of the nations at heart, knows you have to provide the credit to, 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 to support the productive nation, the productive industries of the nation. That's farmers, that's manufacturing in particular. It's very interesting that the national parties have now put out this manufacturing report. That's what should be happening. That should have happened 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, where were they all this time? So the tide is t changing from yeah. away from this looting, this ravaging from the shutdown and the sell-off of private or public infrastructure to the private interests, where you're seeing a massive looting operation now at the end phase, swapping over to, well, that's not been very good for us, has it? It's taken 40 years, yep, yep. right? But it's not very good for us, so therefore, what's the difference? Well, let's go back and look, look at history. Let's look for what's been done in the past. Let's cast aside... A lot of the political axioms, oh, you know, government can't be too big. You can't have government provide services. Well, isn't it interesting that in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, guess what has, guess who, who has to step yeah. up and provide the services? And even then you've got consultancy agents in the background, you know, Price, Waterhouse, Coopers and so forth, consulting them because the public service isn't big enough to do Strip this. Bear. yep. So th this is the, the change that is coming. It, it, it is a sea change. And the fact that President Biden's come out with this I would sort somewhat of a weakened expression um, of, of the uh, the need for an infrastructure bank, given all the hot air and stuff that's in it, is nonetheless a sign of the changing times. Yep. All right. Well, so these are very positive developments. We f we see how a national infrastructure bank, a national development bank, and a a, po a public postal bank with Australia Post. Um, all working in tandem as part of a national banking system that Australia could have, which puts the, um, uh, you know, you'll, you'll still have the private banks, but they will very much be operating on a leash, right, where they can't be the predators they are. Before we go, I'll just mention, um, you'll see on our YouTube channel next week, we're putting up a, an interview on this very courageous debanking victim, uh, Paul Thomas of Commander Security, and the interview is called Coward Banks Crushing... Uh, cash and competitors, right? And he tells the story of his debanking experience, etc. But that's what the, you know. To, to give you an example, of what the banks are like. We need a public alternative to that, because both for the benefit of the people who use it, but also that more than anything else, we'll start um, giving those banks the, uh, the the reality check they need to pull their heads in and start acting properly, because they'll have to compete with a public alternative, right? And no people want to use it, and they'll have to behave better. Um, and this is how you can turn our economy around because it, it all begins with that. So, Craig, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Thanks to the viewers for tuning in. Stay tuned for what happens next week at the uh, Australia Post hearing. 
sign and share that petition and share it and share it and share it. Let's get it to 10,000 as fast as we can and tune in next week for more of the Citizens Report.